Let the insults and sarcasm begin. You're listening to Raw Mike Richards, heard only on News Talk Saga 960. News Talk Saga 960. Oh my goodness. The book is called The Storytellers. From the Terrible Turk to Twitter, uh, another book by Greg Oliver and Stephen Johnson, the Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame. This is uh, from ECW. Um, and as I said beforehand, the beauty of any of these wrestling books. You don't need to. You don't need. You don't need to be uh, like. Obviously, if you're a aficionado, if you're a huge wrestling fan, these these books are great. But I'm saying for their worth, in which the content, the the, the actual he's ta- it's, it's interesting it's called the storytellers. There is no better subject matter. No. Nope. For writing a book, a documentary, doing a movie, it doesn't matter. I mean, that's why, what was the, uh, the, the was it called The Wrestler? That movie about the movie? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah a very good movie. Because it was, it was the content. People said, so what, it, it's going to win uh, Academy Awards? Yeah, actually, it wins Academy Awards. Because the content of this particular sport, or if you want to call it sports entertainment, whatever you want to call wrestling, it is by, by far... The, the 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 sport the uh, entertainment uh, uh, medium that has the greatest fan base and the most consistently hardcore fan base. So, in writing yet another book for uh, Greg Oliver, uh, you can't get better content than what he's writing about. And Greg joins us now. Good morning, Greg. Hey, good morning. Hey, thanks for that praise, uh, Mike. I really appreciate that. Well, I I just think, uh, Greg, you know, uh, not only the books that you write, but just again, it comes to the subject matter. There is nothing more diverse. There is nothing more interesting. Some of this stuff is so far to left field, for what, what these guys actually, where they came from, where they ended up. How can you beat content in the world of wrestling? Well, it's just such unique men and women that get into the business itself. It, it's, you have to be both a great athlete. You have to be a great self-promoter. You have to be great at you know, performing. Uh, there's so much magic that goes into professional wrestling that uh, it, it's pretty easy to dig up some gems. But even we were surprised by some of the gems we dug up. Uh, you know, just people that nobody ever talks about from maybe the 40s or the 50s. And, and that's, the, that's the great joy of writing is you find something, and you sort of go into a rabbit hole and you're like, I got to get more on this. I got to get more on this. And then eventually you do. Well, you know, you talk about the 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 going back. Uh, as I always tell the story about uh, wrestling in my hometown, which depending on the the tour and where was it. So I'm talking early seventies and Stov- territories and the territories. Yeah. So Stovall, Ontario, early seventies, and I see Haystacks Calhoun, and that was such a huge story in our town because of all the chickens he would eat for lunch. He'd have like three chickens and two jugs of milk, and you could see people that you knew in the paper watching him. This, this giant person eat and the show around it it was it was a, a phenomena it was it was a spectacle even though it's in your hometown arena but the place was packed and i'm like how the heck do i actually know about someone named haystacks calhoun the stories never end I, but that's also a wonderful example of how things have changed right that used to be the talk of the town they, they'd bring the wrestlers like dave mckigney the bear man would parade the bear downtown Everybody would hear about it and think about going to the show that night. Now wrestling's fighting for attention, you know, in a world of, you know, 2,000 channels and streaming and this and that. And there's so much wrestling on TV now, but you don't get that same impact that you did back in the 70s when, you know, there was one show and it came to town and, and everybody was curious and wanted to go see it. Yeah, okay, well, let's dig into that, Greg, because uh, when I first started the fall for the sport, it was it was in the era of where good guy would fight bad guy. The story would be told in the ring. Uh, it would also be told as far as interviews are concerned. This is what I'm going to do to you. This is what's on the line. This is how was that different before the 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 wrestling on TV angle as far as being able to tell the story between two guys uh, that would feel and, and, and take it to different areas of not only North America, but the world. Well, I mean, even before television, they were doing it in newspapers. Uh, in the section on our broadcasters, I talked to Bill Mercer, who was the, the broadcaster of World Cha- World Class Championship Wrestling, where we all know the Von Erichs and the Freebirds have yep. their big feud and stuff. But he used to broadcast wrestling on the radio. 
So you need to talk about describing what happened. Yeah. You know, we talk about a Joe Bowen, you know, how he, his call is different than a Bob Cole or whomever. Like that, that's just a great example. Imagine trying to describe pro wrestling for a local <laughs> audience on the radio. Yeah. Yeah. No, no doubt. Okay, so let's take it to 2019, where there isn't a clear-cut angle from who's bad and who's good, but the story still has to be told. What what are we seeing differently today that you may or may not like? Well, so much of it is fighting for attention. Yes. That's sort of the best way to describe it. Whether you're having a Twitter war or you're flaming somebody on you know, the Instagram posts or whatever it is, or even on television, they're trying to get some dramatic angle that gets you to tune in, that gets you want to do it. It's not any different than they had the ESPY Awards last night, and WWE now has its own segment called, you know, the, the greatest uh, WWE moment of the year. Like, if that doesn't show that wrestling has arrived in the mainstream, it's not some curiosity with giants like Haystack Scalhoun coming to town. It shows that it's really arrived, that, that wrestling is part of the mainstream, I'm not sure it gets respect, but it, there's no denying it's part of the, the mainstream. It's funny you say social media, too, because it wasn't too long ago that uh, Ronda Rousey uh, and a number of her competitors, because it was a three-way battle, uh, I believe it was just before WrestleMania as well, a lot of people, you know, just, just casual social uh, you know, media people would sit there and say, this this sounds like they really hate each other. They, I, I mean, like some of this looks legit, and and what was published and what was said on TV. It's uh, uh, you're absolutely right when you're when you're you know you talk about trying to grab attention because uh, for someone that doesn't watch it as frequently as he used to, uh, you had my attention. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I mean, and and that it's women doing it. Yes, uh, is is even more important. And Rhonda's wonderful. She was she brought so much joy to performing. Um, you know whether she was good or bad. I, I just really enjoyed her. She's she, is she's polished as the next, you know, as a Charlotte Flair. No, but that didn't matter because she brought such energy, I, and that's that's a lot of what pro wrestling is too, right? If if you can buy into them, if they have that, you know, charisma, um, you know, like a guy like Coy Leonard, as great as he is, he doesn't really have that charisma that makes you jump up and go, wow. You can respect him as an athlete, but as a pro wrestler, you need somebody that you buy into that goes. This guy makes me want to get a ticket, as opposed to a team effort. You're, you're often buying a ticket to go see, well, I'm really in love with Randy Orton. i got to go see him. We're in conversation with Greg Oliver. The book is called The Storytellers from the Terrible Turk to Twitter. So, so Greg and Stephen Johnson. Do you want me to drop the Stephen Johnson? I don't have to say his name if you don't want. <laughs> <laughs> I had no comment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, how, did it, how did it work with you and Stephen then, uh, considering that, you, like, like, was it, I'll take this angle, you take this angle? And, and how did you guys actually collaborate in putting this together? Well, the, the short version is that this is our fifth book in the Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame series. Uh, we did Canadians and tag teams and heels, and then we, one we called Heroes and Icons. And so we had just had so much stuff left over. It's like, well, we got enough for another book. And then we sort of started playing around with ideas. And, and this was Steve really drove a lot of this one, uh, the storytellers. And, and we tried to, throughout the book, tell the details of how wrestling stories have been told through the years. And um, a lot of the more current stuff ends up falling to me just because I'm more involved running the Slam Wrestling website uh, that I know Kenny Omega uh, can talk to him on the phone kind of thing. Uh, you know, whereas Steve loves the really old guys, and he loves the thrill of the chase where you're making 28 calls to find the long-lost uh, right. great-granddaughter of, <laughs> of the Terrible Turk or whoever it might be. You know, I always thought it was interesting, you know, and again, the, the, the not being a hardcore uh, wrestling fan, and certainly, you know, d d don't have any of the, the breadth of, of someone like, like like David. But, you know, when I, I, you know, when you're a kid and I see like, uh, I don't know, Miss Elizabeth and, you know, you see s some of these, you know, the so-called beauties. And I thought, then I saw the name, the fabulous moolah. I said, ooh, I wonder what she looks like. Not Miss Elizabeth. Elizabeth. That was uh, <laughs> that was not the look I was uh, expecting to see. But again, part of the show, like, kind of was that, was it not? It wasn't that everyone. Certainly back in the day, not everyone was a was a beauty. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. They. Um, but you needed that variety, right? If you had the good-looking blonde, well, she could be up against somebody who was not quite as attractive. And then there was that immediate, well, you know which one was good, and you knew which one was bad. And it made it really easy. <laughs> now those lines are all gone, and, and I wouldn't even say blurred. They're just gone. 
Um, but yeah, certainly Mula, you know, you saw that she meant business just by looking at her. She had such a mean look. <laughs> you knew you wouldn't mess with her on the street, let alone no, in the ring. No, I would not. I wouldn't mess with her in a Sobeys. <laughs> uh, yeah. Hey, you bring up Kenny Omega, one of uh, one of the great, uh, not only Canadian wrestlers, uh, shout out to Winnipeg, uh, but wrestlers throughout the world. Uh, he's, he's joined AEW like a lot of people have. And I guess, Greg, for the most part, AEW uh, has kind of... Put their put their emphasis on the wrestling world of storytelling itself. Are they are they how do you, how would you compare them if if we're list, if a viewer is listening a listener is listening right now of what AEW wants to do compared to WWE because it looks like at the AEW level it is going to be one hundred percent about storytelling. Yeah, it, it, we're all sort of very curious. Uh, it looks like early October they're going to start back on um, I think it's on TNT one of the Turner stations, so very mainstream station. And that's the real challenge. Will they be able to keep that up week to week? Right now they're telling stories through a few online videos on YouTube and then with their occasional pay-per-views and specials. In fact, there's uh, one this weekend, Fight for the Fallen. So they've been able to keep these storylines going uh, without having any sort of mainstream way to tell it. As right. in television being mainstream. YouTube is, is certainly a different medium to do it. And that's sort of the whole point of the, the book, is that storytelling still exists. There's just different ways to do it. Um, so the real challenge would be on weekly television. I mean, we can disparage WWE all we want for storytelling that drives us nuts, and maybe we don't want to tune in, but they're also doing like nine hours of live television a week. <laughs> it's crazy. It's insane. Yeah. Who else does that in the world? You yeah. know, a, a football guy, sure, but there's 16 games on a, on a weekend. No, that's exactly. Okay, now with the Omega uh, reference, storytelling in North America is a heck of a lot different than storytelling in Japan. Do you guys touch on that in the book as far as the different regions of the world and, and the emphasis that is placed in, in, in Japanese style of wrestling? It's really hard for a gaijin, which would be their term for you know a non-Japanese person, to really write a lot about it. And Steve and I have debated that over the years. We just if, without the expertise, it's really hard to do it. I mean, yes, it's touched upon because guys go to Japan and they yeah. they often come back with new skill and new ways to tell stories because the Japanese fans, by and large, you know, sit on their hands and they react not to the. The showboating that we're used to here in North America, they, they respect the athleticism and the real toughness a lot more. And that's what gets their reaction. So the wrestlers who go over there come back to North America with a whole different mindset. Uh, Kenny Omega is a great example. He, he started working in a promotion called DDT, which is a lot more comedic in Japan. He wrestled a nine-year-old girl. Yeah. Uh, and it was, a, it was an incredibly entertaining boat. <laughs> is it pro wrestling? Yeah, at some level. But more importantly, it, it, it got attention, it got Kenny's name out there, and it, it was all part of the building block to make Kenny Omega, you know, one of the top wrestlers in the world today. I usually reserve that for uh, my family get-togethers around Christmas after a couple of cocktails. <laughs> and nobody seems to enjoy it, especially the nine-year-old. <laughs> You know, Greg, uh, thanks so much uh, for joining us uh, here this morning. I said it's just so fascinating. I'm just, Look, as much as you say, well, I think we've covered everything. I don't think there's anything to write about. I'd give it five minutes because you're going to think of something because there's that much material to cover. And every time you do it, I think it's always a winner. So once again, the storytellers from Terrible Turk to, to Twitter, uh, both Greg Oliver and Stephen Johnson, ECW, the publishers. Thank you so much for joining us. And I'm sure we'll talk to you again soon, buddy. Thanks for having me on the show, boys. That is, uh, once again, uh, Greg Oliver, that is, you know, but it is so true. Um, like he talks about, you know, like I wasn't aware that the Japanese fans kind of just sat on their hands and like that would be very weird for a North American fighter to go there, do a big flashy move and, and do whatever your signature thing in the air is. And no one's responding to it, as opposed to the luchadores in Mexico, where I think they just cheer everything. They do, yeah. I, they go. It's a rock concert, and they go nuts. You just got your morning drive back. Raw Mike Richards on News Talk Saga 960 with traffic on the fives. Featuring the best and most detailed West End traffic in the GTA. Raw Mike Richards and traffic on the fives. Exclusively on News Talk Saga 960.